Without them, we couldn't do this. We're grateful. Today, I want to talk about rejection, how we deal with rejection. Because in the text that was read earlier, that was the theme. It was about Jesus being rejected by the people in his hometown. This is just after the text that we looked at last week, where Jesus healed a little girl who had died and a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years. And the disciples followed Jesus after that to his hometown in Nazareth, a distance of 19 miles on foot. Now you have to remember that in those days, people did not travel that far. There were no cars or buses. And so this is a testimony to their acceptance of Jesus. Their willingness to follow him tells us that they were hearing some things that they liked and they, and they believed, and so they followed Jesus. We know that throughout the Gospels, the disciples were present for most of the teachings that Jesus conducted, and they were there for many of the healings as well. And so they, like those who had heard him in the synagogue that day, they heard wisdom when he spoke, when he taught. They heard words of wisdom. Now, the disciples accepted those words of wisdom, but the people in Jesus' hometown did not. And why? Why didn't they accept? They recognized the wisdom, and they, they knew that it was something beyond Jesus' ability, but they did not accept it. Jesus presents himself at the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he begins to teach. And the people of his hometown rejected his teaching. They rejected him on the grounds that they knew him. You would think that because they knew him, that he was one of them, that they would accept him. But they rejected him. At first, they were amazed as he, as he taught. And they were asking questions like, where did this man get all this? And they were amazed. But as the story unfolds, they went from amazement to offense. They, they went from saying all these wonderful things to tearing his character down tearing down his family. They said, is not, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James and Joseph? You see where they went? They went to the fact that he didn't have a father. In those days, illegitimate children were a big deal. They were considered um, a stain on the family's name. And so that's where they went. He's just a carpenter. Who, do, who is he? He's nobody. That's pretty much what they were saying. That he was not someone who sat at the feet of a rabbi and learned about the scriptures. He wasn't of the right pedigree. He came from a family where his father was questionable. Who his father was was questionable. And so the people refused to believe based on what they knew about Jesus. How many of you have experienced people like that? They refuse to see you for who you are because they know your family. They know your story. They know what you used to be and what you used to do. And so because God righted your life and you're on the right track now, they can't wrap their minds around who you are today. They are rejecting who you are. 
and they're going to a place that is familiar to them, that is easy for them, that will make them feel better if they can pull you down and tear you apart. <clears throat> that is what this hometown crowd was doing. Yes, they were correct that Jesus did not receive special training. But the fact that he was so wise and he was so able to do many miracles should have been a little red flag. They should have been able to figure out that if this guy is an ordinary guy on the corner and he's now teaching with all this wisdom and he's able to heal sick people, shouldn't they have said to themselves that this guy had to have had a divine encounter with God, a, an encounter that positioned him to now do and teach. But they did not. They did not. You see, they were unable to see that the carpenter had been transformed and had been endowed with divine power and wisdom. The writer of Proverbs says, for knowledge and understanding come from the Lord. Proverbs 2.6. That's where Jesus got his wisdom and his power from. It came from God. But because they were so bent on tearing him apart, they could not see that. But friends, Jesus was no stranger to rejection. He had known rejection from the time he was born. Remember, there was no place at the inn for him. He had to be in the stable with the animals. That's where he was born. And all his life, he dealt with rejection. In fact, he experienced rejection up until the point where he died on the cross. If you remember the story in Mark chapter 5 when he had gone to a place and there was a demon-possessed man and he had healed that man and the demons begged Jesus to drive them out and send them to the pigs that were feeding nearby. Remember that story? And when Jesus did that, the people were afraid of Jesus after that because they came and they saw the demon-possessed man in his right mind. And when they heard what had happened to the pigs, they made a delegation and they went to Jesus and they begged him to leave their community. They, they begged Jesus to leave after he had restored a man that they knew was sick. And so Jesus knew what it means to be rejected. He experienced it in his ministry. And so that comes to you and I. We live in a world where we cannot escape rejection. It's everywhere. We just reject it because of the color of our skin. Let's face that fact. We are rejected because we are brown people and black people. It's in schools, it's in church even. And rejection is painful. There's no one who can say that rejection does not hurt. It is painful. But we can learn something from Jesus, from this text, about how he dealt with rejection. Let us pray. God of love, we come to you recognizing that you are the only one who never rejects us. We thank you and we ask for a word now that will indeed encourage our hearts, lift our spirits, and help us, O oh God, as we hear your word, to go out and be a blessing to others. So may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts together may it be acceptable in your sight, for you are our Lord and our Savior. Amen. So Jesus teaches us in this text how to deal with rejection. 
The first thing he did, he acknowledged the rejection. He didn't ignore it. He acknowledged it. When he saw it and heard it, he said, prophets are not without honor in their own hometown and among their own kin and in their, in their own house. So he acknowledged that rejection is real. And he acknowledged it in their presence. And he did not try to change their minds. So that's the first thing that we need to do. Recognize it, acknowledge it, and then turn. Notice Jesus did not try to convince them. He didn't try to present more arguments as to why they should accept him. He did not try to tell them what he had learned and how he had come by his wisdom and his knowledge. He did not try to explain the miracles that he performed. Jesus recognized that they would not accept him no matter what he did or said. You hearing me, church? There are some folks who will never accept you because they've already made up their minds that they're going to reject you. And there's nothing you can do about it. For some people reject you just because of how you look or how you speak. So there's no point in trying to change your mind unless you can change how you speak and how you look. So Jesus did not. And that's one of the reasons he went on to the other places. So some of us, we are not sharing the good news of Jesus Christ because we are afraid of rejection. We are afraid that the message would not be received. But remember, when you share good news, the good news of the gospel, it is God's good news you're sharing. And if it is rejected, that's not on you. It's on the person or persons who are hearing the word and choosing to reject it. The prophet Samuel, when the people of Israel had asked him for a king, he was the leader at the time, and he felt hurt and rejected, and he went to God with his hurt in 1 Samuel 8 verse 7, and God said to him, uh-uh, do not feel hurt. They are not really rejecting you, Samuel. They are rejecting me, God, from being king over them. So when they reject your message or your, your testimony, it's not about you. It's about them and God, because it's God that they are rejecting. Amen? They are not rejecting you. They are rejecting God. And sometimes, we are the ones rejecting people. Yeah, I think I would leave you out. No. We are the ones sometimes that are guilty of rejecting people. For whatever reason, we reject people and we hurt people and we hurt them. I have encountered people who don't like a woman pastor. I've encountered that. And they've rejected me because of something that I cannot change, my gender. I can't change that. That's how God made me. And I'm always going to be a woman. But some people reject me for that. And that's good. Because I know that I don't have to beat up myself and say, well, I did something wrong. I know that's not about me, it's about them. And it's about them and God. So some people are guilty of rejecting. And so that's their loss. That's their loss. 
I always say that I'm the best thing since sliced bread. And so if you reject me, that's your loss. And I encourage you to have the same attitude. If they reject you, that's their loss. Move on, move on. And you know, the truth is, some of the people that rejected you years ago, when you look back now, you're thanking God that they rejected you. When you see how life unfolded for them, you're thanking God that you were not caught up in the mess. And so God did you a favor by having them reject you. So don't take rejection to heart. Don't wallow in it. Don't wallow in it. Just acknowledge it and move on. Jesus acknowledged it and he pivoted to the other people where he was accepted. So you're going to waste time trying to stay in that rejection when you can move on to people who will accept the message, people who will accept you and all that you bring to the table. Move on. You'll go for a job and they say you're not the right fit. They're really saying to you that we don't need you because you might just not be part of our culture. You don't have the color. You don't have the, co the ethnicity. And they reject you. You might be overqualified and they still reject you. Move on. Move on to the next job. Move on. Jesus moved on. He went about, the text says, he went about the villages teaching. And not only did he teach, but he called the 12 disciples. And he sent them out two by two. And he reiterated this fact that they might be rejected. And he told them what to do. And if we were to read Mark chapter 6 to, in its entirety, we would see that those disciples went out and they were very successful. They were able to cure sick, preach the word, and, and exorcise demons. Jesus had given them authority over the unclean spirits. They went out and they would, did what God, Jesus asked them to do. Someone just reminded me, Sister Pat, in our prayer, that I've been here for two years. Yeah. <laughs> two years went by just like that. And my leadership, some people rejected. Some people rejected, and I'm okay with that because they're not really rejecting me, but the God who called me. Amen. Jesus, as I said, was no stranger to rejection. He told his disciples that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. This was the faith community of Jesus' time. One theologian explained this rejection by the faith community this way. He said, synagogues with established religious traditions and authorities were not always susceptible to new ideas and activities that may have represented a new move of God. Because that's what Jesus' movement was. It was a new order. It was a moving away from the old laws and a moving toward grace. And so the church at that time could not get with it. And so they re rejected Jesus. I want to tell you a true story about Michael Jordan. When he was a teenager in high school, he tried out for the varsity basketball team in his sophomore year, and he was rejected. 
by the school's coach. He was rejected. And remember I said rejection hurts? The story goes on to say that he went home after he was rejected, after the coach told him that he wasn't tall enough and that he wasn't that great a player, he went home and he cried. He locked himself in his room and he cried. It hurt. And then he decided that he was going to practice so hard, he was going to use all his energies to be better. He couldn't make himself taller, but he said he was going to practice really hard to make himself a better player. And we know how Michael Jordan ended up, right? His NBA record is stellar. And that's what he used. He used that rejection to fuel his passion for the game. And he became one of the best basketball players in the world. Record, his NBA record is, they say it's as high as his vertical leap. And that's what he did. So rejection does not have to be a bad thing in and of itself. We can use it. We can gain energy from it. And we can use it to do wonderful things in our lives and in our church. I want to draw your attention to one other thing that Jesus said. He said, if any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. That's what he told the disciples to do. Okay, you go there to preach and teach and heal and they reject you. This is what you need to do. You need to shake the dust of that place off your feet as a testimony, not against you, but as against them. When we testify against someone in court, we are providing evidence that we hope will convict them of a crime. Am I correct? And so, they're found, if they're convicted, they're found guilty. So Jesus now in saying to the disciples, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them, tells me that there's a day of reckoning for those people who reject the word of God and the message of God and the servants of God. So there's a judgment that is attached to rejection. There's a judgment, friends, attached to those who reject God's word. And that's what was going to happen to these people. They were going to be found guilty by God. Those persons, in their attempt to reject the disciples, are re rejecting God. And so today, those who are guilty of rejecting the love of Jesus Christ stand in judgment, and God will judge them to be guilty. Because by rejecting the message of salvation and rejecting God, you stand to be condemned. Those persons are rejecting the loving sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Their salvation is at stake. It's in jeopardy. And that is why we cannot hide behind rejection or anticipated rejection. Because if they don't hear the word, then we will be guilty of not sharing the word. And so once they hear it, it's now on them. So our job is to tell. The word of God says how beautiful 
are the feet of those who bring good news. You think your shoes cute that you have on? Your shoes, your feet will be cuter if you go with the gospel. If you go and tell. So we are supposed to tell in spite of rejection. Because the word of God says in Matthew, truly I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's Matthew's version of this same story. If you go to tell them and they reject you, then judgment will come upon them. So church, do your part. Do your part. Don't be afraid of rejection. We know how the story ended for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Let that not be on you. And so, as I conclude, I say, rejection is just a part of life. We can't escape rejection. Somebody, somewhere is going to reject us. Thankfully, God never rejects us. God will never reject us, no matter what we do or say or think. There are those who will reject the word of God that we will share with them. Acknowledge the rejection and turn to those who will accept you and work with you and not against you. And then shake the dust off your feet and keep going so that God's kingdom may be expanded here on earth and that you would have done your part in doing so. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you for your unconditional love. We thank you that we are fearfully and wonderfully made by you and that you never reject us, but you call us closer. Today, we lift ourselves up to you and we ask, oh God, that you would remove the hurt caused by rejection. We ask, O oh God, that you would empower us to go out and share the good news of Jesus Christ. Help us, O oh God, not to wallow in rejection, but help us to move to those who will accept your word and receive our testimonies. We pray, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit will speak through us as we seek to share your gospel. And for those who reject your word, we pray that your spirit will witness to their spirit that they are children of God and that your spirit will lead them into all truth, the truth of your gospel. We thank you for your word and we pray, O oh God, that your word will take root in our hearts and our lives. For we pray in no other name, but in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. Would you stand, church, as we bring our worship to a close? If it had not been for the Lord on my side, tell me where would I be? Oh Lord, where?
Bella, tell, tell me where would I be? Oh, Lord, yes. Where would I be? Can't find it in me away. Let the sun, you let the sun shine through a cloudy day. He brought me in the cradle of his love. When he knew I'd been mad and, and torn. torn. Oh, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, tell me, tell me where. Where would I be? Where would I be? Oh, yeah. Where would I be? Amen. Now go. Go in joy, go in peace, go to live out your faith in the community, go to tell others that Jesus Christ is risen, that he is king and that he is Lord. Go and may the God of peace and joy and love go with you and empower you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.